But uh, it's good to be back, and we're back in Colossians, as Seth said, and back where we left off. We finished uh, a couple of weeks ago with chapter 2, verse 10, and so we resume our study in verse 11 of chapter 2 through verse 15. Paul is explaining what Christ has done for us on the cross, and he writes, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross." When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Now, I'd make a small correction there at the end. There's some question as to how we're to translate that last phrase, in him. That's literally the way it can be translated, but also by it is also a, a legitimate way. I think you may have that. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. I think in the New International Version, they do translate it of the cross. So it can be translated by it. And I think that that's the correct idea that the statement triumphed over them by it links back to the last word in verse 14, cross. This is the instrument of shame that was turned into the instrument of conquest and victory. And that's what he's describing here. Well, may the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. There is a poem we read when I was in school, not far from here, over 50 years ago. One line from it stuck with me all those years. I will drink life to the lees. The lees are the sediment from yeast that settles in the bottom of a bottle of wine. The statement means, I'm going to drink to the very last drop, meaning have all that life has to offer. The poem is Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. It's about the Greek hero who fought on the plains of Troy for 10 years and then another 10 years sailed on the Aegean Sea trying to get home. But now at home, safe in his kingdom of Ithaca, he longs for those past adventures. He sees the ships below and the dark sea beyond, and he resolves to leave his peaceful island and explore the world. I cannot rest from travel, he says. I will drink life to the lees. We would put it a different way, live life to the full. In funerals or in obituaries, it's sometimes, sometimes said that he or she lived a full life, which is saying they drank life to the lees. That's a good way to live, to the full. But what is the full life? Is it a life of travel, a life of adventure? of exploring, a life full of experiences and stuff? Probably to many it is. We all want a full life, don't we? We want the very best life. Everyone does. That's the, the appeal of Tennyson's poem. Paul said we have that. Believers in Jesus Christ have that life. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he wrote, In Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in, you, in him you have been made full. Now the 
New American Standard Bible from which I'm reading has, you have been made complete, but that word complete is the word full. In other words, we are complete in Christ. He has made us full so that we really can live the best life. Not one of temporal pleasure, but of eternal value. And in the next verses, Paul illustrates what Christ has done so that we can live well, so that we can live rightly, so that we can have the full life, the very best life. It's all due to his sacrifice on the cross and what happened to us when he died for us as our substitute. That death, that work on the cross changed us. First, it put to death the old self, what we were in our unregenerate, unbelieving state. That's what Paul says in verse 11 when he describes the believer as having been circumcised in Christ's death, what he called the circumcision of Christ. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision is the ritual of cutting away a small portion of flesh from the body, the rite that every Jewish boy experienced on the eighth day of his life. But this is a different kind of circumcision. It's one made without hands. It is a spiritual circumcision, an internal circumcision, which is what circumcision always pictured. It's what Moses spoke of when he told the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Later in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6, he says, God will do that. And what Paul is saying here is God has done that in every believer through the sacrifice of Christ. He has not removed just a, a small piece of flesh, but Paul says the body of the flesh. The ritual of, uh, ritual of circumcision signified that the the person who underwent that in ancient Israel was separated from the world. That's what it signified. You're a different people now. Separated from the world, separated to God. So that young Israelite boy was at that moment different. He was now a son of Abraham. He was a citizen of Israel. He was dedicated to the Lord. What that symbolized has been fulfilled in all who have believed in Christ, male and female. We have been separated from the old life that was controlled by the flesh, the whole of it. We've been separated from that and dedicated to God. It's what uh, Christ has done for us. He did it for all for whom he died when he died. And we appropriated it, we made it our own when we believed. That's when the circumcision that he gained for us at the cross happened to us at the moment of faith. And when Paul says the body of the flesh, he, he means that the whole person was affected by this uh, spiritual surgery. The whole person was changed by the work of Christ on the cross. At the moment of regeneration of faith, at the moment of the, the new birth and conversion, we became different. We became a new creation in Christ. We are no longer under the control of the flesh, which is a way of referring to our sinful nature. That's been put off. Now, that doesn't mean that the Lord has eradicated sin from our lives. We still have within us what Paul spoke of as the law of sin or this principle of sin within our members. Sin's still there. We still struggle with it. We still struggle with failure, and we will do that till the day we die. That's the battle we face every day of our lives. But the Lord ended the mastery of the flesh. He broke the power of that sinful nature so that it no longer rules. 
We have a new nature. We have a new heart. The heart of stone has been taken out. A heart of flesh has been given to us. A living heart. And through it, the Holy Spirit guides us and He enables us to to walk faithfully. Enables us to obey. We are not the people that we once were. That's what Paul is saying here. The, The old person has died. The old person has been cut off. It's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He uses different words, different imagery, but he's really saying much the same thing when he says, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. When he died, I died, Paul is saying. He settled everything at the cross. Death is sealed with the burial of the body. That's when it's really complete, and that's what Paul says next in verse 12, to say that this this is a completed thing. That those who died with Christ on the cross were buried with Him in the grave. And His illustration for that is is baptism. So He moves from circumcision, which many of those in the Colossian congregation would have undergone, to baptism, which both the Jews and the Gentiles in the congregation would have undergone. Uh, Water is not mentioned in this Example. So it's not the act of bad baptism that does this. Again, it is symbolism. He's using the, the, uh, the, the image of circumcision and the image of baptism to illustrate his, the spiritual realities that we have experienced. And going under the water pictures the burial with Christ of the old self that was circumcised or cut off with Christ. Uh, It is dead, he's saying. It's been buried, he's saying. Now that's Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Our old self was crucified with him in, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, might be buried as it were, might be made powerless so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. That is a complete change from what we were before our new birth and conversion. Our old self was in solidarity with our sin nature. So the sin was very natural. It's completely natural. Now it is not. Doesn't mean that we don't sin. Of course we do. But sinning is not natural to us as it once were. What once was. Emil Bruner put it this way. Previously, the ought did not suit us. Now, sin does not. The the ought is what we know we ought to do. And men have always known that. All men have this sense of ought. They have this sense of right and wrong. And they know what they ought to do, but in in the unregenerate state, they don't want to do that. And that's what we once were. We were at one time a people who, who did not want to do the ought And now we do want to do that. We're no longer comfortable with sin, whereas before we were. That's what the cross and our spiritual circumcision in Christ has produced. Sin's power has been disabled. Baptism pictures the the final confirmation of death. The, The old self has been buried. But it also pictures resurrection when the the baptized one comes up from the water as Christ came up from the grave. And that is what Paul speaks of next when he says that you were also raised up with him through faith in the word of God who raised him from the dead. That is the guarantee that we will be resurrected in the future when the Lord returns. But this is also a present reality. And that's really what Paul is referring to here. The the, the present reality that we have spiritually. Believers are a new creation. We've been raised to new life. Through faith, we joined ourselves to Christ and to his life, actually to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We're now joined to his resurrection life. He is in us. That's the mystery that Paul explained earlier in chapter 1. Verse 27, Christ in you. 
So we are joined to Christ. We are in Him. And in Him, Paul has said, are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's our present condition. The fullness of deity is in Him. He is God's eternal Son, equal with the Father. And He, of all things, He is in us. That is the full life Christ has given us. We are free from sin's dominion. And we are empowered to live righteously. And we need to know that. We need to know that in order to act upon that. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. He wrote, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He's saying, reckon this to be so. Reckon these things to be true. Consider them to be so. It's very important how we think about ourselves is what he's saying. That's part of the work of sanctification. Realize what Christ has done and who you now are. You're not the person you used to be. And you've been empowered to live differently. Well, what Paul says in Romans 6.11 is a command. In fact, I believe that's the first command in the book of Romans. So he gives us a lot of doctrine in Romans until we come almost to the middle part of the book where he gives the first command, and that is consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Consider yourselves to be spiritually circumcised and, and, and baptized spiritually. As I say, that's a command, and it's vital that we know who we are and what we have and consider it to be true that we no longer are under the rule of sin, but we are now under the reign of grace. That's true. Paul told the Colossians that they have been made full or complete in Christ. They have a full life. They have all that they need to live triumphantly in this world of temptation and opposition. And that's true for all of God's people. We need to know that and daily to consider it to be so. We've been cut off from the old life and we've been made new. We have all we need for a full life. So we are to live it to the full. But to do that, I think we need perspective. I think that's what Paul is saying in the next verse, in verse 13, if if you want to know what God can do with you now that you are his child, now that you are his son or his daughter, now that he brought you into his family, remember what you were when you weren't his child, when you were in your unregenerate and rebellious state. What were you then? Well, Paul reminds the Colossians what they were in verse 13. Dead. Spiritually dead in their transgressions and the uncircumcision of their flesh. In other words, spiritually dead but alive to sin under the control of the flesh. And that's when God made them alive. Now, if God can make the dead alive, what do you think he can do with them what do you think he can do with you now that you are alive and now that you are circumcised in your heart and now that you have a new nature and now that you are his child, his son, his daughter, and now that you're dedicated to him? What can he do? Well, it's good to look back on what he has done when we were dead to know what he can do now that we're alive. Isaiah did that with Israel in Isaiah chapter 15 and in verses 1 through 3, he, he invites them to think back on what they were. He, he uh, states to them, he, he says to them, uh, Look to the rock which you, from which you were hewn, to the pit from which you were dug. Look, he said, to Abraham and to Sarah. Well, what were Abraham and Sarah? They're, they're the pit from which Israel was dug. They're the source of the nation's existence. And, and what were they? They were dead. They were like rock. They were as, as, as lifeless as stone. 
as a, as a quarry from which Israel was dug. Abraham was impotent and Sarah was barren. She was 90 years old, he was 99 years old. Good as dead, Paul said, when God made a nation from them. That's supernatural. So what God was saying, or what, what, what Isaiah was saying, is God can do great things with them. When he wrote that, he was writing to a people that were defeated. He was writing to a people that were be in captivity. And he was comforting them, encouraging them, saying, look back to your past, look to your origin. The Lord God created you out of two dead people. Don't think it's over. He can do great wonders with you now that he's created you. And then he goes on in verse 3 of Isaiah 51 to talk about the millennial kingdom and the glory of it. That the kingdom is not, is not gone. It's going to come. It's a promise and, and you're going to inherit that. That's what he's saying. But go back to the beginning to get some perspective on what God can do for you now that you're his child. And he will do mighty things with us as well. He has and He will as we walk by faith. It is His work, not ours. Now, we are responsible and we must act. And that's what, his, that's what the ground of all of this is. But it's His work, really, from start to finish. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 2, verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Well, if we are by nature, dead, then we must be His workmanship. Otherwise, we'll stay dead. Dead men don't do anything. They don't respond. They can't. So God does. He saves. That is grace. That is sovereign grace. He chose a multitude for Himself. That's unconditional election. He sent His Son to die for them, to save them. He did that on the cross. That's particular redemption. Then the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to apply to the elect the blessing and grace that Christ gained for them on the cross. And when they hear the gospel, He opens their heart to respond, to believe. And they do. Mysteriously, they do always. People hear the gospel and they discover that they believe it. Something's happened. What they disbelieved before, what they thought was foolishness, suddenly they discover that's true. It's, it makes sense. They believe it. That's sovereign grace. They're regenerated, circumcised in heart, born again, and then able to understand and believe. That's Sovereign grace, irresistible grace, and He promises to keep every one of His children in faith to the very end. Believers will continue believing to the end. That's perseverance of the saints. All of that is contained in that short statement, when you were dead, He made you alive together with Him. Now, none of this is to suggest that the, the faith of a believer isn't real. To say faith is a gift is not to say we don't really believe. It's God that believes in our place or something like that. No, it, it is a, the faith of a believer is a genuine response to the truth. It's a genuine response of the mind and will. It's an act of the will based on knowledge, understanding, and conviction. But that is only possible because the Holy Spirit first quickens the sinner, gives life to the dead, so that the person can perceive the truth, respond in willing and glad trust. It's a work of God from beginning to end. Remember this, when, when you heard the gospel, you brought nothing to your salvation but a spiritual corpse. He made you alive. There is no way to parse that away. There's no way to change those words. They're very simple and very direct. 
He made you alive. There's no greater work than that. If the Colossians would just reflect on that, on their origin, look to the pit from which you were dug, understand that you were dead and he made you alive just as he gave life to Abraham and to Sarah, they would be delivered from what F.F. F. Bruce called such inconsistent syncretism. And what he means by that is the, the false teaching that had come to their town that was uh, drawing some to its itself, kind of enamoring some of these people. And he's saying that if you understand that, then you will be disabused of these, these false notions, this, this idea of a, this, that, that, that mixed truth with error, which really destroyed all truth together. There was no gospel in what these men taught. It was all heresy. Salvation is of the Lord, not of God and man. Not of faith plus baptism or faith plus works. Baptism is there, works are there, but they are the consequence of the new birth. They are the consequence of salvation. They are the fruit, not the root of salvation. And those who have believed in, in, the, in the Christ of Scripture have this glorious blessing and assurance from God, the judge of all the earth, that he has forgiven us all our transgressions. That's what he says next. And what a blessing that is. That's really an amazing thing. All our transgressions, all our sins have been forgiven. The law of Moses didn't promise that. Willful sins, defiant sins, what the Bible calls sins with a high hand, weren't forgiven by the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. Those sacrifices of Aaron could not remove those sins. But the cross of Christ dealt with every sin of the believer, past, present, and future, sins of omission and sins of commission, sins of not doing what we should have done and sins of doing what we should not have done, all our transgressions. It's complete. There's nothing left for the believer to do. God in Christ has done it all. The work of salvation, the work of forgiveness is finished. Now, if he did all of that while we were lost, what will he do for us now that we've been found? That's certainly the implication. But Paul's not finished here. So that there be no doubt about the extent of God's pardon of the guilty, the apostle adds another description in verse 14. God in Christ has not only pardoned all our sins, forgiven all our transgressions, he has removed them, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. That is a reference to the accusations of the law of Moses against the Jews and the accusations of the inner voice of conscience against the Gentiles. Paul calls it a certificate of debt. We might picture it as a, a, a black slate on which all of our debts are written, each one in every detail, and, and you begin to add up all of these debts and you realize you're, you're living under a mountain of bankruptcy beyond anything that we can pay. And then in one stroke, Christ erases it all, leaving a clean slate. He canceled out all our debts, wiped them off and gave, the, gave us a fresh start. That's grace. Only God could do that. Only He could pay our debts, which He did at the cost of His Son. The certificate with all the decrees against us was nailed to the cross, and there the payment was made. Now, some have su suggested uh, a different image from the one that I used, uh, the slate being wiped clean, and that's one taken from the accusation against the Lord written down and nailed to the cross, the king of the Jews. That's what the Lord claimed to be. The Jews took offense. They thought that was blasphemy, and they said that that was also treason. 
So that was the accusation nailed to the cross. This is the reason he's dying. And, and the, the idea here is just as that accusation against him had been publicly posted on the cross, Christ nailed to the cross all of the accusations against us, all of the sins and debts that we had accumulated, and there he erased them, all of them. Paul has taken pains to explain with vivid examples what Christ has done so that we can live a full life. Our old man died with him on the cross so that our new man could rise with him from the grave. Our sin and guilt were erased like chalk from a blackboard. Find a word of accusation in a pile of chalk impossible. It's obliterated. We have been forgiven. We have been made right with God, never to be condemned again. And we've been released from the slavery of guilt. What a blessing. Guilt has, has rightly been described as a tyrant and a crushing burden. Uh, people cannot live under the burden of guilt. But that guilt has been lifted, taken away. As a result, we are clean. You're clean. Reckon it to be true. And because we are, God's Holy Spirit can live within us. We have His life in us. We have fullness in us. Consider that to be true. But Paul's not finished. Christ has not only dealt decisively with our sin and guilt... He's defeated our enemies. The spiritual forces of darkness and wickedness. That's how he concludes the paragraph. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him or by the cross. Paul was probably answering the claim of the false teachers. I think that's in the background of what he's saying here. And they were saying that the world is filled with hostile angels and powers and uh, they have the secret knowledge to overcome them and defeat them. And what Paul is saying here, his, his answer to that is, no, Christ has already defeated them. No, there's no power in these myths that these people teach. The defeat has occurred and it's occurred through Christ on the cross. In fact, he says he's, he's led them in a great triumph. That's the next picture that Paul gives in this, this sort of gallery of portraits Paul presents in his explanation of what, what Christ has done for us. The public display is like a parade given to a victorious Roman general returning from battle, leading his army down the boulevards of the capital to the forum, along with the prisoners and spoils of war. It's a colorful, colorful way of uh, declaring that Christ has utterly defeated the enemy. They, they, they're still out there and armed. But Paul told the Ephesians that in a similar passage in Ephesians 6, that we're in a battle every moment of our lives. We, we need to wear our armor, our spiritual armor, the enemy, the Spiritual forces of wickedness are there. They're shooting these fiery darts, fiery arrows at us. But their darts are not deadly, not spiritually, not eternally. The devil is out there like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. We're to be sober and, and resist him, and we can. That's really what Paul is saying here. We have the abilities now. Early in Pilgrim's Progress, soon after Christian lost the burden of sin that he was carrying when he came to the wicket gate and came to the cross and it fell off his shoulders and down into this sepulcher and disappeared, he was on his journey. Now he's a saved man and he's on his journey to the celestial city. But very soon afterwards he hears uh, about uh, lions in the path ahead. And when he saw them, he was terrified. But there was a man there named Watchful, and Watchful told him, Fear not, 
the lions, for they are chained. And they, they are there to test the faithful and uh, uh, the, the, the pilgrims who come by. They're a test for them. Keep in the middle of the path and you won't be harmed. Well, Christ has defeated Satan. His forces are under the Lord's control. They, they, um, they can't test us. <clears throat> The, the, the cross is pictured here as Christ's chariot and the demons are chained to it. The instrument of shame became the instrument of conquest. And what we need to do in response to that is walk in obedience. And as we walk in obedience, they cannot touch us, at least not apart from the will of God. And when it's his will, it's only his will so that we be blessed and he'd be glorified. Through his death, the Lord made you alive and filled you with his life so that you can live life to the full. He has placed us on the path to the heavenly Zion. We are traveling that now as believers and new creatures in Christ. And it is safe and sure, but it's not an easy path. It's not a soft life that we've been called to. It has challenges, it has enemies and temptations, and, and it has dangers. But Christ is with us on this path, and not only with us, he's in us. So hard as it may be, we will triumph through faith in him and obedience. That's what Paul is encouraging here. This is the ground for all of that. In fact, J. Gresham Machen spoke of the high adventure of the Christian religion. That's quite a description of your faith. That's quite a description of Christianity. High adventure. And you might wonder, well, how is my life at the office or of taking care of the kids or of studying hard courses in school anything like a high adventure? We think of Ulysses taking his ship across uncharted oceans as adventure. But the Christian life is an adventure, an adventure of faith, because it is a life that is led by the Holy Spirit. And he takes us places. And when we daily obey him, he leads us to some unexpected places where we can be a friend and to help beyond ourselves because he has made us complete and he has enabled us. The Lord has equipped us to live life to the full, to be helpful, to be fruitful, and a blessing regardless of our situation. Even in the most mundane places, you have that kind of life, a useful, fruitful life. One of our deacons, Phil Armstrong, goes to Cuba to minister to the poor saints there. That's an adventure. He would say that those simple saints have blessed him more than he's blessed them. One man there who impressed me that Phil has talked about um, was a quadriplegic pastor. He's bedridden. He couldn't move. Now you might ask, what kind of life could that man have? Where's the high adventure in that? But he had it. Adventure of a different kind, but certainly a full life. He had knowledge of God's word. He had wisdom. And many people came to hear him teach. They mounted a Bible over him that he would read from. And then someone would stand there and turn the pages for him. And people would come to his house, come to that room. They'd gather around the bed. They'd gather outside the window every day and listen to him teach the Bible. He lived life out of the fullness he had within. From the new life and the Holy Spirit, God used him to bless many people. That's one who drank life to the lees. Hardship and Satan couldn't stop him. They can't stop you either. Christ has cleansed you of sin and guilt. 
He has defeated and disarmed the enemies decisively. He led them in a victory parade, chained to the cross. That's Christ's chariot. That's an impressive picture. One of the best descriptions I've found of a Roman triumph is from, of all places, a movie. The final scene in Patton. I usually don't reference movies. Uh, I did not but a few weeks ago, I think, but uh, I usually don't, but this is worth quoting. The, the general, if you've seen the movie, and many of you probably have, has been relieved of his command in Europe, and he's walking across a stark landscape. As the narrator says, for a thousand years, Roman conquerors returning from the wars enjoyed the honor of a triumph, a tumultuous parade. In the procession came trumpeters and musicians and strange animals from the conquered territories, together with carts laden with treasures and captured armaments. The conqueror rode in a chariot, the day's prisoners walking in chains before him. Sometimes his children, robed in white, stood with him in the chariot or rode the trace horses. A slave stood behind the conqueror holding a golden crown and whispering in his ear a warning that all glory is fleeting. The second century church father Tertullian said it a little differently. The slave standing behind the general whispered, remember you're only a man. You're mortal. Nothing lasts. All glory is fleeting. That is true. That's true for man, but not for this man, not for our conqueror, and not for his children whom he has made more than conquerors. That's what you are in Christ. You are in the triumph, alive from the dead, complete, made full, in fact, we are presently described by Paul as going from glory to glory. That's living life to the full. That's the best life. That's really living life to the lees. Are you doing that? Every believer has it in him or in her to do that regardless of who or where he or she is. Reckon that to be so. Then live for him, not for self. Serve his people, and most importantly, know him. Really, there's nothing more transforming and fulfilling than simply knowing God, growing in our personal knowledge of him, understanding of him, relationship with him, in our walk with him. That's how we go from glory to glory. I said at the beginning that everyone wants the best life, a life lived to the full. But that only happens in Christ. So have you believed in Him? He's God's Son and our Savior. He became a man to die in our place. He has paid for our sins by dying for our sins. And that is for, for you, that's for everyone who believes in Him. So believe. And then by the help and the power of the Holy Spirit, live fully. Drink it down to the lees. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what the Apostle has explained for us in the various pictures that he gives here of what your son accomplished for us on the cross, who have been cut off from the old life, that that old life has been buried and it is gone. We still sin. We have that residue of sin within us, that principle, that law of sin. But we do have the ability to deal with it and to overcome it and to live a life that's pleasing to you. We pray that you would enable us to do that, to understand what we are in Christ and to act upon it and live to your honor and glory. We can do that by your grace. We thank you for what your son has done for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.